All right, we, we are going live in a minute. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first webinar of the year 2021, uh, hosted by the Pune Orthopedic Society. And I'm uh, Abhijit Vahegaukar, and I'm very honored to serve as a secretary of the Pune Orthopedic Society. Uh, this is um, the first webinar for the year, and I would like to take the opportunity to wish you all a very healthy, happy, and a prosperous new year. 2020 has uh, taught us a lot of things, and amongst all others, it has taught us to persevere, to prevail, and to persist. And 2021 uh, is a year that will teach us hope. Um, and we step into the year 2021 with a lot of optimism, uh, with a lot of energy. And today we have with us uh, Joydi Furness, who is an extremely um, talented, a very enthusiastic uh, and a very accomplished uh, upper limb surgeon from England. And uh, without further ado, I would just very briefly uh, introduce uh, the Pune Orthopedic Society, the endeavors of the Pune Orthopedic Society and uh, Dr. Fadness. Uh, we have with us the uh, president of the Pune Orthopedic Society, Dr. Karne sir. Welcome, sir, to the webinar. So today we're going to talk about elbow instability. Uh, the Pune Orthopedic Sister Society is very delighted and privileged and honored to welcome you, Joydeep, to the webinar. And we're very grateful to, um, uh, to uh, you have you with us at a very short notice. Uh, this is the current executive committee, and I'm very proud and very fortunate to be working with a bunch of extremely talented and dedicated uh, colleagues and friends uh, who make work very gratifying and very um, satisfying in the academic field uh, that Pune Orthopedic Society is uh, dedicated to. Uh, Dr. Jaydeep Fadness is a hand, uh, a, a, an upper limb and uh, shoulder and elbow surgeon at the Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals in the UK. Uh, he has a very strong interest in education and training and is involved with uh, fellowship training, as well as teaching medical students and orthopedic residents. He is a very talented and a very well-educated and a very uh, vast experience uh, uh, holding surgeon. And uh, this slide uh, is a very brief uh, summary of the vast acumen and the accolades that uh, Dr. Joydeep has. He is a member of the British Elbow and uh, Shoulder Society, the best. He is a faculty member of the Watanabe Shoulder Club, which is a prestigious um, uh, honor. He is a faculty member to the AO and is on the committee of the ESCA and the ISACOS for elbow surgery. He is uh, also a member of the Sussex Orthopedic Research Group, besides being a senior lecturer at the BSMS. Welcome, Dr. Jodi Fadness, uh, to our webinar. And once again, please appreciate our gratitude for being with us. Um, and a very uh, quick and uh, brief uh, uh, word of acknowledgement and gratitude to New Drug Pharma, who has been uh, very consistently um, associated with the POS in academic activities. And with a generous grant from them, we were able to have a full subscription to the Zoom account. Uh, we are grateful for the support, um, and uh, these are the drugs that uh, they manufacture, uh, besides being uh, associated with academics. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Karane sir to please uh, uh, address the webinar, and uh, with the, after that, we could proceed with the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit, uh, for this uh, uh, great event. Uh, I would uh, like to welcome our esteemed guest, Dr. Jaydeep Fadnis, 
all the pos members all the viewers uh, for this first uh, of its kind webinar of pune orthopedic society actually pune orthopedic society is a very vibrant academic uh, body having the international standard orthopedic surgeons the, the two years ago when we conducted a mock on 2018 in pune uh, even the many delegates have said that this was almost uh, that of a double a standard so that is standard now pune has reached we had got a 550 plus members which are not only from the pune district but from all the surrounding district right from the nasik to kolhapur to nagpur and uh, uh, because of this covid situation we could not perform the adequate uh, social events we can say and the cultural events for which also pune food society is very well known and uh, we had our quite dynamic members but uh, um, they, they could not get opportunity to perform all these things and uh, uh, we had conducted certain educational webinars especially uh, our uh, dynamic dr hadgaukar has conducted for the spine as well as dr vahegaukar who is also pre, uh, secretary i mean, I mean uh, executive committee member of the maharashtra orthopedic association has conducted good webinars now uh, i congratulate the efforts of the abhijit as well as all the committee for starting uh, own channel a youtube channel as well as the facebook for the pune orthopedic society and to sort of inaugurate this we have got a international faculty with us dr joydeep fadnis we are very lucky for that and thank you dr fadnis for accepting our invitation and he is going to address rather this topic of the elbow instability uh, particularly posterior lateral in, uh, elbow instability is so rare is a very disabling condition and to address that we have got a icon of this elbow dr joydeep fadnis i welcome you and thank you for this thank you Well, thank, thank you very you much for the. Uh, I'm sorry, Jody. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite, Dr. Karne and uh, Abhijit. So Abhijit has become quite a good friend of mine now for the last three years, and it's been a. It's I, I couldn't say no when he invited me. It's a great honor to be able to speak and participate in you, in in your society, and um, obviously I have close family ties to. india and uh, to pune in particular so um it's great to be involved and i've seen firsthand what the quality of surgeons there is and what you guys are doing so uh, i hope i can help in some way with this talk so i'm going to share my screen and hopefully you can see the screen So I'm going to uh Abhijit can you see the screen just to confirm Yeah so I'm going to talk about rotatory instability of the elbow and um I'm going to tell you I'm really going to concentrate on the pathoanatomy of this injury and how this implicate uh, what the implications of the anatomy and pathoanatomy are on treatment as well as concentrating on application of the concepts to treating your patients rather than just going through rote learning so there are a few key concepts to talk about firstly so we need to talk about the structures stabilizing the elbow the relationship of the radius and ulna relative to each other and the forces exerted on the ulna humeral joint so This is a depiction showing the primary and secondary stabilizers of the elbow. So you have the primary stabilizers in green, they're sort of the inner circle of stability, the last sort of bastion towards uh, dislocating the elbow. And then the secondary stabilizers in the normal situation are the common flexor origin, the common extensor origin, the radial head and all the muscles in fact that cross the elbow and provide stability. so our primary stabilizers are the two collateral ligaments and the ulna humeral joint specifically the coronoid so when our elbows are assaulted by a a fracture dislocation such as this we disrupt these um structures and in treating this sort of injury it's important to be aware that the radial head now becomes a very important secondary stabilizer to compensate for the repairs we've done to the lateral ligament and the MCL uh, possibly and then don't forget these these uh, secondary stabilizers that in the normal setting are 
are sort of in the background, they come to the forefront, especially when we're doing rehab, because we want to harness their dynamic stability when we rehab and help maintain stability during motion following surgery. So the second principle is about the radius and ulna. So remember that the ulna is fixed, the radius rotates around the ulna, and the two are rigidly connected by the interosseous membrane. And this provides longitudinal stability, but it also dissipates load between the wrist and the elbow. The collateral ligaments, the MCL and the lateral uh, collateral ligament are the primary stabilizers. And remember, they originate on the humerus and insert on the ulna. There's no attachment of these structures to the radial head. And therefore, elbow instability is ulnar humeral instability. What we see with the radial head is a byproduct of what's happening at the ulnar humeral joint. So when you see the radial head lying behind the capitellum, it's because, like this depiction below, the ulnar humeral joint is opened up on the lateral side. So finally, you need to be aware of the forces subjected on the ulnar humeral joint. And it's these forces and the variation in these forces at different points of extension during the injury that will give you certain fracture and instability types. So we have various valgus forces, we have compressive axial loading forces, and we have rotatory forces to the elbow. And this is how I classify elbow instability. So it's a mechanistic classification. So into rotatory instabilities, coronal instabilities, axial and longitudinal. And we're going to be talking about rotatory instabilities today. Um, and this includes posterior lateral instability and posterior medial instability, which we'll expand on. The other types of instability are um, valgus instabilities, which may be acute or chronic, such as valgus extension overload, axial instabilities like translecranon fractures and Montegia fracture dislocations, and Essex lepresti lesions. And, and this topic is vast, so we're going to concentrate on rotatory instabilities, which I think is what it will be most useful for everyone. And remember, these injuries can all be acute or chronic. And the axial instabilities tends to be osseoligamentous, but the rotatory instabilities, these tend to be either purely ligamentous, but most commonly osseoligamentous. And the message here is that what you see on the x-ray isn't everything. There is always a ligament injury that needs to be addressed as well and recognized. So here's rotatory instability. We have two types, posterolateral instability and posteromedial rotatory instability. And the x-ray will infer what type of instability you're dealing with. So on the left side, in the posterolateral rotatory instability pattern, we've got a radial head fracture. There'll be a coronoid fracture with some variable uh, pattern and then an elbow dislocation. Whereas on the posteromedial, this on the x-ray may look like a more benign injury, but it's a very severe injury. So there'll be no radial head fracture, no elbow dislocation usually, and there will be a fracture only of the anterior medial coronoid. So let's deal with posterolateral rotatory fracture dislocations first. And this was described by Sean O'Driscoll and Bernie Mori as a rotatory subluxation of the ulnar humeral joint because of a deficiency of the lateral collateral ligament. Well, what does this actually mean in practice? So remember, the radius and ulna are linked and they move together. And the pattern of fractures and ligament tears is going to be determined by the magnitude of the combined varus valgus and rotational forces. So if you look at this ulnar humeral joint in an axial sort of section, and this is the typical sort of injury you'll see falling onto the outstretched hand, there's going to be an external rotation force. And we're talking about the external rotation of the ulna relative to the humerus. There's going to be a valgus force and there's going to be an axial load. And when we do this, what happens is we tear the lateral collateral ligament because of the external rotation force. This causes this dropping of the ulnar humeral joint away and opening of the joint. The valgus tears the MCL and the axial load will cause the dislocation. 
And just to show this in practice, to conceptualize it, arthroscopy is very useful. And if we look at an arthroscopy in the lateral gutter of the ulnar humeral joint, on the left side, this is a normal arthroscopy. Just with forearm supination, i.e. external rotation, you can see gapping of the ulnar humeral joint. So the, this is normal physiologic gapping. But when, when the lateral ligament is deficient and we rotate the arm, you can see how much the joint opens. So this is purely forearm supination, external rotation instability. So what causes PLRI? So it's any pathology that compromises the lateral ligament and gives us this rotatory opening of the joint. And the most common causes will be trauma and so the most common cause is trauma and you might call this a terrible triad injury but this is a posterior lateral fracture dislocation and if this is mismanaged we can get chronic posterior lateral instability and arthritis and it needs to be addressed with fixation or treatment of the radial head and the lateral ligament but how do the fractures occur? We've talked about the instability, how it opens up on the lateral side, but how do the fractures occur? And why are these fractures so predictable? So for the radial head, the fractures occur in shear and compression. And the more valgus we have, the more compressive force we're going to have on the radial head. And the more axial load we have, the more we're going to get an anterior rim fracture. And this is the typical fracture you see in this injury. So an anterior rim radial head fracture with variable comminution. What about the coronoid? Well, the fracture occurs in shear, i.e. the coronoid, for want of a better term, is knocked off as the, L, as the forearm is dislocating behind the humerus. It's important to say it's not a vols. The coronoid tip does not have any attachment. It's an intraarticular structure. And the fracture tends to originate in the anterolateral anterior aspect, like here, and then propagate towards the medial side. So this is a very typical terrible triad or a posterolateral fracture dislocation where we've got an anterior rim radial head fracture, an anterolateral coronoid fracture, and a dislocation of the elbow. So this is typical. Here's a variant injury for anyone that can spot this. So this is there's a radial head fracture, a coronoid fracture, and this. So rather than a lateral ligament tear, we've got a supinator crest fracture, which is the attachment on the ulna of the lateral ligament. So this is a very rare injury, as usually the ligament is torn from the humerus. But this is a bony avulsion, but it's still unstable and needs to be treated accordingly. So you need to look for this. So this is a supinator crest avulsion fracture. So what are the other causes of PLRI? So we can have acquired causes, congenital causes, and iatrogenic, which is not uncommon. So this is a patient with tennis elbow. And on the right side, you can see classic tendinopathy. And, but on the left side, possibly because of multiple injections, the lateral ligament uh, attachment is deficient. So this can be a cause of uh, pain and instability. So in patients presenting with tennis elbow, if it's atypical, I always test them for uh, lateral instability. Here's the very interesting cause of um, posterior lateral instability, a patient with cubital, cubitus varus after a, a supracondylar fracture as a child. So this is a normal shaped elbow. As we go into varus, you can imagine how the, there's chronic attenuation of the lateral ligament with an altered line of triceps action. And this gives us posterior lateral instability. This is that same patient here with this easy dislocation of the elbow. And in order to treat that, we have to correct the shape of the distal humerus and reconstruct the ligament. Well, what about simple dislocation? So the so-called simple dislocation with no bone injury, where does this fit in? Well, this is a form of rotatory instability, but only but very few of these have persistent posterior lateral instability or symptoms. And so why is this? Well, we maintain bony congruency, and that tells us any bony injury is of real importance. And also we think that the lateral collateral ligament and extensor origin are often intact. Conventional thinking was that 
Um, these simple dislocations were a sequential lateral to medial sided failure with the lateral ligament being the first thing to be torn and finally the uh, medial ligament. Well, actually, look closer at this video. What is the mechanism that's happening? As this guy looking at his left elbow, as he dislocates, what mechanism is actually happening? Well, I'll tell you that this is a valgus force and his arm is in valgus at the time of dislocation. And this is backed up by this nice novel um, study that looked at YouTube videos of patients dislocating their elbow. And the most common deforming force was valgus. Um, it was inferred that the first lesion to tear would be the MCL, not the lateral ligament. And this was backed up by my colleague, uh, Adam Watts in the UK, who did MRI scans on all the uh, dislocations that presented them. And they found that the MCL was torn in all the dislocation and the lateral collateral ligament was torn in most. But in fact, the common extensor origin was the one structure that was rarely torn, as you can see here. So our contemporary thinking about simple dislocations is that this is actually a medial to lateral sided injury where the MCL capsule and then the lateral ligament tear. And this gives you the 90% of simple stable dislocations because of the bony congruency and the intact common extensor and flex origins, this will be stable. However, it's these where the common flexors and common extensors are torn that will have this 10% of unstable simple dislocations. And hence, the tipping point seems to be the integrity of the common extensor origin and our diagnosis of those 10% of um, dislocations that will remain unstable is all about recognizing this lateral sided injury. So now we'll go back to our rotatory fracture dislocations and talk about poster and medial rotatory instability. And remember the x-ray features will give this away. So typically there won't be a radial head fracture. Typically the elbow won't have a history that it's been dislocated because this is a subluxation instability. And you'll have an anterior medial coronoid fracture. But remember there are ligament tears and the ligament tears in this lesion are again the lateral collateral ligament and the posterior part of the MCL. So it's all about the coronoid here. So we need to concentrate on the coronoid and it's an anterior medial coronoid fracture. Well, what is the anterior medial coronoid? This is Sean O'Driscoll's classification of coronoid fractures, but it can be simplified by talking about the coronoid. It's this area of the coronoid, the anterior medial facet. And it's or in this fracture pattern, it's typically a concave shape. Why is it concave? Because the medial part of the trochlea has uh, has impacted into it and created a coronoid fracture. It affects the anterior medial region, but can extend across into the rest of the coronoid, like in this injury, and it rarely involves the sublime tubercle. So in fact, the sublime tubercle and the anterior medial coronoid aren't synonymous terms. The sublime tubercle is an extension of a typical anterior medial fracture. So like the forces we discussed for the poster lateral instability, I think it's important to understand the forces involved in the poster and medial instability. So here's a depiction of the elbow again, and the forces in a posterior medial instability are internal rotation, i.e. pronation, as opposed to uh, those in the posterior lateral, and varus as opposed to valgus. And when we have an injury, what happens is we get varus, force which tears the lateral collateral ligament on the outside. So again, the lateral ligament is torn. We get an internal rotation uh, force that tears the posterior part of the MCL. And we get a compression fracture, which is the only thing we see on the X-ray of the anterior medial coronoid as the medial trochlea drives into this area. And this is a very severe injury. It ha the consequences of mismanagement can lead to rapid onset arthritis because imagine that medial trochlea continues to drive and grind into the anterior medial facet. It causes arthritis 
and it's and and this arthritis in this area is very difficult to treat other than with elbow arthroplasty so we need to recognize and treat these this injury aggressively as an example if you look at the plain x-ray the black arrow shows um, the medial aspect of the ulnohumeral joint which is narrower than the lateral aspect and all you can see is a coronoid fracture, no dislocation. So you'd be wrong to write this injury off as being benign. And actually, we need to fix the coronoid and reconstruct the lateral uh, collateral ligament. But do we need to fix all of these? This is a fairly newly recognized concept. And for years, we've not been treating these surgically. And, uh, and there are several studies, including one of our own papers now that say that we don't need to fix all of these injuries. But remember, if we mismanage the ones we do need to fix, this is the consequence. And it, it, we need to do everything to manage the coronoid when it's important. So recognizing when it's important is, in, is essential. And here's an example of a case with a, I remember this patient had grinding on various examination of the trochlea. He had a lateral collateral ligament injury. And we've used, because it was so comminuted, I couldn't restore this area. I acutely removed, uh, transferred his electron on tip into the coronoid. So that's how important that area of the coronoid is when it's needed. So the decision making is all about identifying those coronoid fractures that need fixation. And we use clinical, radiographic and intraoperative techniques to do this. So let's focus on the coronoid in detail. So here on the right, you've got a typical anterolateral coronoid fracture. On the left, you've got an anteromedial coronoid fracture that's extending and the two are different. What we do know is that co the coronoid fracture is characteristic in certain instability patterns and therefore what you what type of coronoid you see can be used to understand and predict the instability pattern so recognition of which coronoid fracture to fix is integral to the outcome so this is the three concept column uh, the three column concept of the uh, elbow uh, stability so the medial column is this is looking at the elbow as a whole. The medial column is comprised of the medial trochlea and the anteromedial facet of the coronoid. The central column is the anterolateral part of the coronoid and the uh, lateral trochlear ridge. And the lateral column is the radial head and the capitellum. If you conceptualize this into a house, then this is your stable elbow with your three columns holding your roof up and the two ligaments on the outside. Now, if we have a simple elbow dislocation, then we know that we tear our lateral and medial collateral ligaments. But the elbow tends to remain stable because we have the bony columns intact. What if we take away the, med the middle column? And this is synonymous with a terrible triad fracture. So the anterolateral part of the coronoid is gone but the elbow re remains stable because we've got the lateral and medial columns. Now, if we have a radial head fracture or we remove the radial head for some reason, then our roof is gonna fall off. And that's why, uh, and, and fixing the MCL is not gonna help the situation. This, the roof has been totally destabilized. And that's why in a terrible triad or a posterolateral fracture dislocation, we must reconstruct the lateral ligament and uh, fix the radial head to restore that column. And that gives us a stable roof. But why do we have to fix the lateral ligament as part of this? Remember, the lateral ligament contributes to both varus and rotatory instability, as we've discussed already. So we must fix this lateral ligament to restore the rotatory stability of the elbow. Going back to our house, if we now have an anteromedial coronoid fracture, which is small, our roof is still going to tip, but not totally dislocate. And this might be repair, this might be salvageable by reconstructing the lateral side of the elbow. However, if we have a bigger, more significant anteromedial coronoid fracture, 
fixing the lateral ligament's not going to help, and we're going to have to reconstruct the coronoid and fix the lateral ligament. So it really boils down to what is stability and how do we assess it? And how do we know that this injury can be treated non-operatively or does it need surgery? So it's all about whether the lateral ligament is competent and, uh, and understanding this and what the coronoid's contribution to stability is in that given injury. So remember, we can use static radiographs and this just seeing a static x-ray in, in Varus tells us the coronoid is important in this injury. This is called a delta sign. We can use CT and here you can see a con perfectly congruent joint despite a minimally displaced uh, anteromedial coronoid fracture. And this patient can be managed either alone with a lateral ligament repair or conservatively. So we need to reproduce, when we're doing clinical examination to examine these patients and recognize which ones need surgery and don't, we need to be able to reproduce the varus and internal rotation stability. And I use a varus stress test for this. And we need to diagnose the presence of lateral ligament insufficiency. And I use the posterior lateral rotatory draw test for this. So here's the posterior lateral rotatory draw. It's very similar to a Lachman test in the knee, and it can be performed on awake patients in the clinic. And it tells us that the lateral ligament is torn or attenuated. And all I'm doing here is pushing up on the radial side of the forearm and looking And this. If the lateral ligament's torn, you'll get this clunking of the elbows that subluxates. The varus stress test, we put the arm using gravity varus, take x-rays, and even in the clinic, you can recognize this because as the patient moves their arm, you'll hear or feel grinding as the medial trochlea falls into the coronoid. And if I feel this uh, grinding or grating or locking, then the coronoid needs addressing. Just a note on coronoid fixation, we can do this open or arthroscopic depending on the fracture type, but in general, it's going to require either AP screws, PA screws or buttress plating, but we need to fix the coronoid. Suture fixation was um, talked about in the past and in my practice, I would tell you that this, this is not performed at all. I never perform suture fixation of the capsule or the coronoid. If the coronoid is big enough that it needs to be fixed, and I've recognized this from my instability test, then it must be done properly. Sutures simply don't provide the rigidity or stability to do this. What about the radial head? Do we fix, replace, or excise it? What's the method of fixation? And which replacement and how to get it right? Well, I'm not going to cover all of this, but I am just going to mention that excision of the radial head is a bad idea in the instability situation. And remember going back to the load transfer across the elbow, if we remove the radial head, then all our load is being transferred from the wrist through the ulnar humeral joint. And this results in rapid arthritis of the ulnar humeral joint. We also get longitudinal instability, which happens slowly over time, and valgus drift. And these are two of the hardest problems to sort out in the elbow. Hence, we can avoid this situation by preserving the radial head in the presence of elbow instability. So what's my general surgical algorithm for fixing these rotatory fracture dislocations? Well, you can see that we always repair the lateral ligament, whether it's a posteromedial or posterolateral instability. If it's a posterolateral instability, we fix or replace the radial head and we do these things always. Sometimes if the, con the coronoid contributes to instability, if it's that anteromedial type, then we will fix it, but not always. And similarly, sometimes we'll fix the MCL if there's residual instability, but this is uncommon. And very rarely we'll think about salvage procedures. So I really reserve these for patients where the ligaments are so badly shredded that we actually have to reconstruct the ligaments acutely, such as using internal bracing or ligament reconstruction using uh, grafts 
or very, very rarely using a, an internal fixator. And in my practice, I haven't put an external fixator on for five years now. So um, these are for the very rare injuries. So why is the lateral ligament more important to repair than the MCL? Because it, we always repair the lateral ligament. Well, remember that the lateral side of the elbow is under constant gravity varus loading in all activities that we all do, such as every time you lift your arm up like this, there's, a, there's gravity varus force on the elbow. So lateral ligament deficiency is poorly tolerated. In contrast, the medial side of the elbow, the MCL, is only really stressed in throwing sports. And most of us don't put our arms into this position to stress the MCL in day-to-day -day life. So it's better tolerated unless you're into certain specific activities. Well, just a final note on chronic instability and some interesting cases. Chronic instability is exactly the same. It's the principles must be followed exactly as we've discussed. Restore the medial and lateral columns of the elbow, the bony columns, Con focus on the anterior medial coronoid, the radial head, and reconstruct the ligament. And we want to achieve early range of motion. Here's a case of a lady with, uh, who I treated with chronic posterior medial um, instability. She actually had this for nine years. So she had uh, a fairly benign looking coronoid fracture and a lateral um, deficiency. So we went on to use her opposite sided coronoid uh, electronon tip to graft a coronoid and reconstructed her ligament. Here's a case uh, that just to highlight what can go wrong. So this patient had a six week old fracture dislocation in a different hospital. She'd had five operations by the time she was referred to me. And this x-ray is when she was referred. The, you can see that she's got three anchors in the elbow. The elbow's still dislocated. There's an x-fix on. And just to highlight that the uh, surgeons hadn't, uh, hadn't grasped the concepts we've been discussing, they then put a plaster over the x-fix. And this is by definition, clutching at straws. She also had radial and ulnar nerve palsy. So this is a real mess. But if we go back to our first principles, we can achieve a good result. So we removed the residual part of her radial head. We use that to graft the anterior medial coronoid. So you can see on this x-ray, I've ignored the anterior lateral part and the coronoid is actually sitting against the anterior medial facet of the, um, uh, the against the trochlea. And we, and we reconstruct the ligaments using grafts. And this give, restores our columns, it restores the roof and allows her to begin motion. Another case just showing posterior medial instability. And then another case of a chronic dislocation, going back to first principle, restore all the, all the bits of the joint on the roof and you'll get a stable elbow. And finally, just a word on rehab. A good rehab means you have to do you you have to have done good surgery. So in my my hands, I would leave the theatre with a stable elbow in all positions. Um, we then can allow immediate active range of motion, and the emphasis is on active motion, so we can utilise the muscle forces across the elbow during rehab. And remember, all the muscles that cross the elbow impart a compressive joint reaction force. So we want to harness this in rehab. And therefore, we don't want to put the, uh, the elbow into a plaster or a brace that limits these, these muscle forces. I do use a tubic grip because it gives some proprioceptive feedback and wakes up the muscles after they're asleep. And we use supine physiotherapy. So supine physiotherapy converts this gravity distractive force in the a standing up position to a compressive force on the joint and it also wakes up our muscles the triceps and and engages the uh, the muscles so in summary so rotatory instability of the elbow it's important to understand the pattern anatomy and forces involved the coronoid fracture is predictive of the instability for pattern and it's important to understand which type of coronoid fracture you need to fix we always need to repair or reconstruct the lateral ligament. And I urge you not to excise the radial head. Thank you.
And if you want to learn any more or uh, have a look at our YouTube channel and my website here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joydeep. That was a fantastic talk. I, uh, it's, it's, it's been a very wonderful learning uh, experience, especially the way you simplified the understanding of the elbow instability was uh, remarkable. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, what role does arthroscopy play Please. in um, in diagnosing those uh, fractures of the coronoid, the, the impression fractures? So do you ever perform arthroscopy and then determine if that uh, fragment needs fixation or not? So I, um, I think my... So I use arthroscopy for diagnosis of instability, but I use it more in the chronic setting. And... Um, if you're interested, um, for those of you guys who are interested, please look in arthroscopy techniques. We've just published a te uh, our technique for doing arthroscopy, but it's mainly for diagnosis of chronic instabilities. Now for the coronoid, um, I think you must get a CT scan and you can recognize the size of the coronoid and the location of the coronoid from the CT. So you can basically make a, an assessment before surgery on whether you're gonna go, you're gonna need to treat the coronoid. But I confirm this with the clinical tests I showed. So if they fall into varus clinically and they grind and grate, then I'm gonna be fixing that anteromedial coronoid. Um, I hadn't presented it, but in a study we just published in JSES, if the coronoid's bigger than six millimeters in size, in our series of about 50 cases, then there's a good chance you're going to, you're going to need to fix it. So that's a good indicator. Um, so, but then I, would, I occasionally will use arthroscopy to fix the coronoid, but not necessarily to diagnose if it needs fixing. Right. Um, you know, and it's, there's a quite a lot of dilemma as far as the radial head is concerned uh, to fix or to replace. And as you just showed uh, very emphatically, excision of the radial head does cause the shift of the uh, load transfers from the wrist to the albumeral joint. And then uh, the same applies to the wrist, you know, where we are more concerned about the ulnar head. Uh, now, as far as the radial head is concerned, can you share with us your thoughts and uh, some insights as to what kind of replacement and um, what is the uh, most optimum way of uh, dealing with these uh, problems or these issues. Okay, I'll sort of summarize. So obviously preservation of the patient's own joint and radial head is, is ideal. And in the younger the patient, the more I'm going to try to fix their radial head to preserve it. However, what you don't want is an unstable fixation that's taken an hour and a half and is going to fall apart because a revision of to a radial head is is, un, is is not what we want because radial head replacement does very well. So essentially a radial head replacement or fixation is reasonable in the right scenario, but try and fix younger patients. The key with radial head replacement is how to get it right. And you don't want to, there are two or three concepts. One, it should be in the axis of the forearm rotation. So the stem should be pointing at the ulnar head if you take an x-ray. Secondly, you don't want to overstuff. So when you measure the size of the radial head, you want to take the radial head's oval in shape. So you want to use the lesser diameter of the radial head as your size, if that makes sense. And then to reference length, which is the key, um, you, you must use the PRUJ. So the proximal part of the lesser sigmoid notch, the radial head shouldn't be proud of that. So, and that's the most reliable anatomic way to avoid complications when you do the radial head replacement. Sure, because, you know, we all have been uh, taught that I think radial head replacement is very challenging in trauma because of the problems of either overstuffing or understuffing the joint. And thanks for all those tips. Uh, one more very quick question was your uh, point about not using extent fixators. Whereas uh, Hotchkiss, uh, you know, proper the idea of using the compass or the hinge fixator, especially in all these very complex, very unstable joints where you kind of go and do a fixation, but despite 
uh, you know, whether you do a good fixation or not, uh, you know, early range of motion always remains a challenge. And he did, uh, you know, kind of suggest the use of compass fixators or, you know, hinge fixators. So what would you suggest and what is your thought on this uh, aspect, please? So I, I can, I, in, a, in over a hundred rotatory fracture dislocations, I can tell you we've not put an external fixator on. And I think the reason is we really recognize these injuries. And in the majority, if you understand, if you go to the anatomy lab and understand how to dissect the lateral ligament and repair it with a robustly, Re reconstitute the columns and don't leave the theater till you've done all those bits and revisited them. You, it's, it's rare that you'll need some sort of supplementary treatment. Now the times where we have needed something extra, in <laughs> fact two weeks ago I had to go in on the weekend or, to help one of my colleagues uh, because it was an open fracture dislocation and in the open injuries or the open injuries with a vascular injury are the ones where you might need something else to guarantee stability while the soft tissues or the, or the vascular anatomy heals. In those cases, I've gone to using an internal brace or very rarely an infix. So I've used that once or twice now. So by, that's made by a company called Skeletal Dynamics. But actually, the internal bracing is just as good. And if you reconstruct the ligaments with that, it's very straightforward to do if you know the anatomy and you'll avoid using an X-fix and all the problems that come with an X-fix, like I showed in that case. Right. Great. Um, uh, I, I just have one or two questions, if that's okay with you, Jody. Please, um, no, it's, it's much yes, nicer thank to you. discuss. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, in, in chronic... Uh, rotatory instability repairs, what is the choice of the tendon that you use? And uh, do you couple it with the internal brace and has the introduction of the internal brace made your reconstruction and repairs more robust? And does it make you feel more, uh, you know, kind of comfortable with uh, early mobilization? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and very um, topical. So, uh, in terms of grafts, um, there's a whole host of grafts that have been described from uh, the various types of autograft. My particular choice is I use an allograft, a gracilis allograft for the reconstruction. But what you asked about the internal brace is really uh, interesting because in the last couple of years, I've started more and more preserving, dissecting and preserving the patient's native ligament, even in the chronic setting because it's often attenuated, not withered away. And then if the tissue quality is reasonable, I will repair this primarily and use an internal brace over the top of it. And I've, the success has been brilliant with that and it avoids the need and cost for an allograft or graft site morbidity and actually makes it a very quick operation to do a lateral ligament reconstruction. So now I reserve the allograft for um, those really chronic situations, very unstable, or where the tissue quality is poor. Great. Um, and um, uh, the, the one more question that I had was, uh, you know, there's, there, are, there have been a couple of reports or uh, instances where they have used one single uh, tendon graft to repair both sides. So the lateral and the collateral yeah. as well as the yeah. Middle, middle, middle collateral, like a yeah. box concept. So uh, what is yes. your take? Uh, should we do it as uh, a single kind of a box repair or should you repair it as individual kind of, uh, you know, um, ligaments yeah. for that matter? So both um, Sean O'Driscoll and Greg Bain have described the box loop technique. I've, I, was one, I was Greg's fellow some years back and we did some box loop. The, the problem... I. I find with the box loop type techniques is that it's very difficult to maintain tension throughout the system, um, the correct tension. <clears throat> and you need to use interference screws uh, in the ulna and the uh, humerus, ideally. So like I said, with once I've, you've been able to refine your technique with 
lateral and medial ligament reconstruction, especially if you're using internal bracing plus their own tissue, it actually becomes uh, quicker to just do um, both sides. And it means you can do both sides through separate incisions that are smaller rather than raising big flaps to do a box reconstruction. So I, I don't use that in, in my practice. Great. And one more question was about the clinical aspect of uh, rotator instability, especially in the chronic setting. Uh, do you always recommend, um, you know, examination under anesthesia vis-a-vis -vis just relying on an outpatient clinic visit? So I, I can honestly say that the poster lateral rotatory draw test, if you can learn that one test, it will help you hugely. It's like Imagine if the knee surgeons didn't have the Lachman test, how many different things they would be doing to, so they don't, they can probably rely on the Lachman test to make the diagnosis of an ACL tear. And similarly, it's so sensitive that I can very happily say there's a lateral ligament deficiency and go to theater planning to do my reconstruction almost without, I, I don't even get an MRI after that because I know it's going to be torn. So uh, that's described by Sean O'Driscoll, and I urge you to uh -huh. read it and, and practice it. It's really useful. Sure, I think I think that's a, that's a very nice test and is very um, you know kind of reliable and reproducible in diagnosing instability. Um, how much would you rely on an MRI um, uh, kind of a investigation or stress X-rays for that matter in uh, putting into evidence? Uh, a PLRI or a PMRI, please. Yeah, so um, I think an MRI can be useful, particularly in the simple dislocations where I mentioned where we think, you know, if you're worried about a dislocation that might remain unstable, an MRI, and if you see all the flexor origins, both flexor origins, both ligaments torn, then that might be one you consider taking to theatre. Um, the, the MRI I tend to use for either patients where I can't make a clinical diagnosis. I Sometimes they're in too much pain, they're guarding. Um, th then I use an MRI to add to my diagnostic sort of arm memory. But I don't tend to do stress x-rays, I have to say, because the stress x-rays are done in extension when the... Um, when the el the ulna the, the electronon is locked into the electronon fossa, and I don't find them particularly useful. Yes, so really, it's the clinical examination and the MRI that help me most. And 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 in the acute setting, how soon will you get the MRI done? That's question number one, uh, because you know um, when there is a hematoma within the joint around the tissues the MRI may not be as accurate in diagnosing these ligament injuries. Question number two was, um, how soon do you operate on, or what is the latest that you should operate on uh, an acute presentation of an elbow instability? So we're talking mainly about simple dislocations, right, Abhijit? Because yes. uh, fracture dislocation, mm -hmm. we, want, we know we have to operate on them. So sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. simple yes. dislocations, then I will, um, I, I, I don't tend to get an MRI. I immediately, I wait to see how the elbow will pan out. I let them move it. I start the active range of motion, get their muscles working and see them about two or three weeks after the injury. Only then if they have persistent instability, they're not making progress as I'd want them to be, then I'd get an MRI and think about theater. But it turns out it's very rare that that's necessary. My, my colleague, uh, Adam Watts in the UK, he, uh, partly because of his research, he MRIs every simple dislocation on the basis that he can make the diagnosis early. But I don't think we are confident enough that the MRI can pick up the stable and unstable ones. Uh, I can justify that. And so I think it's reasonable to wait and you can repair these ligaments even at three, like I said, even in the chronic setting, the tissue quality is good, you can repair them. So I'm happy to wait for a little while and it ends up that we rarely need to fix them. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and especially on a Sunday, um, 
morning, I guess, at your place. And uh, it's been an illuminating day. Thank you very much. Uh, Yogesh, do you have any questions if you're still around? I should apologize on the behalf of a president who had to leave for another uh, webinar. And he expresses his, uh, his uh, regret that he could not continue. Um, and um, I didn't see any questions popping up uh, either on the YouTube chat. But uh, if there are any questions, we will, um, we will address them to you. We'll forward them to you, uh, Joydeep. And I am uh, very optimistic that you will consider being with us uh, again and share your knowledge and acumen uh, with us and uh, you know, keep, keep on teaching us. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you. And on behalf of the Bune Orthopedic Society, I really express my sincere gratitude because this was at a very short notice and I know how difficult it can be to manage your surgical schedules and your Sunday commitments with family. And uh, you've uh, been uh, a joy to, uh, a joy deep, I would say, a <laughs> joy to uh, work with it. So I really cherish your friendship and uh, it's been a great learning experience. Thank you so much, Joy deep. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Yabi Jit. It's, it's, it's my honor, absolutely my honor and privilege. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Uh, have, happy New Year. Have a great day. Wish you a happy New Year. Stay Bye. safe. Bye. Bye.